Well, good morning to you, City Light. We are so excited to get to join you this morning. And we've really spent some time in prayer just asking the Lord, you know, that somehow when we come together in these moments virtually, that it could be as if there's no distance because we know there's no distance in the spirit. And so we send greetings to you. Uh, we love you, we miss you, and we really are counting down the days until, you know, it, it's great to worship, but there's just something about coming together corporately for that. And we so miss that. And so as we begin this morning and as you assume your position of worship, whatever that looks like for you, let's just open up in prayer and I want you to pray with me uh, one of the things in this season that has been so clear to me in many ways is that you know prayer and worship and his presence is not something that we watch you see in the Old Testament Moses went up to the mountain and he heard from the Lord and then he came down from the mountain and he released that word but in a New Testament hour each one of us, we get to hear from the Lord. And so we're asking this morning that you would humble yourself before the Lord and that you would agree with us. And our heart for you is that you sense his presence as you lift him higher and as you worship him. And our heart is that, that you hear his voice. And so let's just uh, join hands together across the virtual distance. And so... Father, we thank you, O oh God. We praise you, God. We lift the name of Jesus higher today. And God, we're running after you this morning, God. You say that if we seek you with all of our heart, that you will be found. And so today, we are running after you. We are seeking you. God, we want to hear your voice. And so would you just begin praying and would you begin releasing your praise and your confession to him today? Father, we call upon you, God. And this morning as we sit in our homes, could we minister at your feet today, God? Could we have that, that moment where we pour out all of our perfume on your feet today in worship? God, we, we bring... We bring what we have to you, which is the very breath that you have placed in our lungs. And we bring that before you, O oh God. And we say it's yours. Our very life is yours today. And so, God, we worship you. Would you begin by worshiping him? Would you begin by praising him? Would you begin by giving him thanks? And so, God, we bless you, O oh God. We give you thanks, oh God. We magnify the name of Jesus today. We lift you higher, oh God. We lift you higher today, oh God. We say be lifted higher in our homes today, oh God. Be lifted higher in our families today, oh God. We lift you above worry today, oh God. We lift you above fear. We lift you above just sheer boredom. We lift you higher. We say you're so good, oh God. Would you begin telling him how good he is? Thank him for the things he's given you. God, I thank you for provision. God, I thank you for a president who's guiding our nation even now. I thank you for help. I thank you, God, for the, the sight to see you today, for the ability to come together through technology. Oh, God, we lift you higher. God, I praise your name that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we bless your name. We bless you, name. We pour out all our perfume today. It's all yours, oh God. It's all yours. It's all yours. It's all yours. God, I even think in that story when that woman poured out that perfume, they said it 
was her dowry was about a year's worth of salary and she poured it all out on his feet. And so today we enter into worship and we pour it all on your feet. We say you're beautiful today. Would you come close? Could the very breath of your presence be felt across our homes and in our living rooms? I thank you for living room revivals this yes, morning, Lord. God. Yes, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We praise you, God. We lift you higher. We lift you higher, oh God. A good, good Father. We bless your name. Oh, yeah. 
Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us, show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. No. 
the power of Jesus Christ who conquered all and who lives in us. We call on you right now that we will not live in fear any longer, but we live by faith because there is nothing that can come against us that you do not allow, Lord. So we submit to you. We submit to your authority, dear God. For you are Lord, you are King, you are Lord, you are King, yes, you are Lord, you are King, you are Lord, you are King, you are Lord, you are King, yeah. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is in us, then what can say yes? And if our God is for us, and if I got his feelings, then what you said against If I got his for it, then who could ever stop it? And if I got his feelings, then what you said against it? If I got his for it, then who could ever stop it? And if I got his feelings, then what you said morning the Lord wants to remind you that you're an overcomer yeah. so father I thank you God that you have given us the keys out of revelations to overcome God we overcome by the blood of the lamb the word of our testimony and that we don't love our lives so much as to shrink yes. back from death and so God I praise you father for the overcomers that are listening even now, I thank you. Would you begin just receiving that spirit of overcoming and releasing it over those you know? I really believe that in these moments we come together and we're strengthened, but we also begin crying out 
for those who cannot cry out for themselves. And so, Father, we receive the overcoming promise that you gave us as believers, God, that though there's trouble all around us, though there's tribulation oppressing all around us, Father, we receive your blood, the keys to overcoming this morning. And God, we receive your peace. I thank you, Lord, out of Isaiah that you say, the work of righteousness is peace yes. and the fruit of righteousness is quietness and assurance. And so God, we receive yes. your quietness today. We head into the cleft of the rock and we rest in deeper wells of you. Father, we receive the peace that you died on the cross for. We receive the peace of the Holy Spirit, which is the promise that you left on this earth. And Father, we begin crying out for those who need to receive your peace. And so would you begin by name? Maybe you have loved ones. Maybe you have friends or clients or customers who really need to feel the peace and the presence of the Holy Spirit that you, my friend, actually carry with you this morning. And so let's just begin releasing peace over those who need to see and feel his peace. And so, Father, we come before you, and I begin by standing in for our president today. I ask that you would release supernatural peace over our president, over our vice president, over their spouses, God. Would that peace trickle on down through the cabinet, through the White House? Could the peace trickle down, Father, to the House, to the Senate, to the Congress, to the governors, to the mayors, Lord? I ask that you would release your peace over them. And this morning, we agree together for the peace that you are releasing, the supernatural peace that only comes from you. Out of Isaiah 40, this is what you say. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so friends, today I release that comfort over you the power of the holy spirit i ask right now supernaturally across virtual streams that the power of the holy spirit the great comforter be released and god we comfort others with the very comfort that you've given us and so father i pray for the comfort of your holy spirit to be released over city light like a blanket today God, I pray for the staff members, for Pastor George and Pastor Sarah, for Trevor, Father, for, for Kanisha, Father, for Josh, Stacy, for, for the staff members and the team at City Light. I pray for your peace to be released like a blanket. <coughs> I lift up the gentries to you and, and Merriweather Farms, and I ask your peace to be released like a blanket. And Father, we receive comfort and father we release your comfort father the very comfort that you're filling us with even now god we release that to others and so as you receive his comfort this morning would you begin crying out for those who need his comfort today and so father we cry out for doctors for nurses for staff members in hospitals father we release your comfort through the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you release that over hospitals today? We speak to hospitals in our city, Father, the four corners, God, and we ask for your comfort to blanket our city like never before, oh God. Could the clouds represent the very snow, the, the, the fluke snow that we had? Could that be a prophetic parallel of the comfort and the blanket of your presence that's white as snow covering our city covering our city the comfort of the holy spirit we release over pastors
tears over churches. I release comfort over those who are in deep mourning, oh God, who have lost loved ones, who have sick loved ones. We release the comfort and the power of your Holy Spirit, oh God. We release comfort over those who are sick in our city today. We ask for the comforter to come as only you can do, oh God. We thank you for the comfort of your spirit, Father. We thank you that you come and you speak in spirit and in truth, oh God. Release your comforter today, God. We honor you. We thank you that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and we don't love our lives as to shrink back from death. And so God, this is our story. This is our story today. And we stand on the Ebenezer's father of our story and of our testimony. And we declare your goodness. And so as we sing this next song, I challenge you to think about your testimony, to think about your story, to think about those moments where the comforter came. And would you just begin praising him and remembering, just let's pause this morning and remembering all the good things he's done. He's so faithful, friends. He's so faithful. I sing peace like a river, peace in the storm. I sing peace like a river. You overcame, you overcame the world. I sing peace like.
here um, connecting with the glory of God through creation. It is so amazing to be a part of uh, nature and seeing how God sings his own praises through all of creation. It glorifies God. I have um, been marveled at the way that uh, the global church has been able to connect with one another. Even this week, I was watching some of our friends, our Open Bible friends in Tijuana, Mexico, um, have church. I watched a service from Japan, from one of our Open Bible churches there. And it is so amazing to, to see how God is moving across the globe. And never before in history are Christians more connected with one another than they are right now. Now it is truly a unique time to be alive, um, and I am I'm thankful to be a part of it. I have also seen throughout all of Christianity um, this kind of incredible thing of of connectiveness. Uh, but interestingly, the same way that a virus spreads from one another, um, also you can kind of see different thoughts and beliefs and ideas in the church also spread from Christian to Christian in a massive scale like never before. It's so important now um, as believers that we anchor down into truth, into hope, and know what we believe and why we believe it and stay into the message of Christ and into the message of Christianity and what the Bible says and no, and let no outside thought, idea, power, principality, lofty idea elevate itself uh, above Christ and above the message that the Bible brings. You know, Christianity plus nothing uh, does not equal, Christianity plus anything else does not equal Christianity. Uh, the Bible plus anything else is not the Bible. The message 
of God mixed with anything else is not the message of God. Today, I want to talk about our belief. What is belief? We know from the scripture that belief is so important. But we also know that, uh, hey, just as the Bible says, even, even the demons believe in God and they shudder. So there is a particular kind of belief that is really, really important. I want to read a little bit about uh, Hebrews chapter 3. It's this incredible um, incredible chapter in Hebrews. The author of Hebrews is, is um, explaining, is comparing uh, this, this spiritual leader figure called Moses that led the ancient uh, Israelites through the d desert, out of captivity of Egypt and through the desert and became a mouthpiece for God, giving them giving people an instruction on how to connect with God and introduce uh, them to God and how to follow God. And, and Hebrews compares, the book of Hebrews compares this figure of Moses to the figure of Jesus. And really in the Hebrews chapter 3, it says there is no comparison. It writes this in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, uh, 5 and 6. It says, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ, as a son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. If we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. But then something really interesting happens. Hebrews takes a dramatic shift from the story, from the comparison of Moses and Jesus and goes to the next level. But before that, brings this powerful, um, I would even say uh, this prophetic kind of correction. Um, you can almost sense the writer of Hebrews experiencing this, this uh, as he is writing with the authority that God is speaking through him, feels this overwhelming sense from the Holy Spirit to interject this message and in it it says this today you will hear his voice today when you hear his voice do not harden your hearts as israel did when they rebelled when they tested me in the wilderness there your ancestors tested and tried my patience even through though they saw my miracles for 40 years so i was angry with them and said their hearts always turn away from me they refuse to do what i tell them so in my anger i took an oath they will never enter the place of my rest hebrews the, this verse in hebrews brings a, a prophetic correction brought from psalm 95 it's it's a passage from psalm 95 and the, the writer of hebrews just drops this in here saying this is what the holy spirit is saying right now who is it that rebelled against god what is the story referring to that i believe that we can bring a relevant message to us right now this is a warning uh, not to take the same path that the Israelites took them, that postponed their destiny, that brought them back, uh, that, that brought them back from what God had destined them and said because of their rebellion and disbelief, actually paused for 40 years what God had wanted to bring them into. What's this story? It comes out of Numbers chapter 13, and it's this, this story of the... 12 spies you might be familiar with it it's 12 scouts that god tells moses i want you to send 12 scouts into the promised land into the land that i told you you would have and i want you to send those scouts in and they're going to do an audit they're going to do an assessment and they're going to bring back a massive report and we want to know who's in it what's in it and how much and be specific so god picks up uh, so Moses picks a person from each tribe of Israel, and now there's 12 of these scouts and sends them into uh, the promised land that they're going to inhabit someday. And they see an incredible sight. They, they describe it as a land filled with milk and honey. 
And from that land, they, they harvested uh, some grapes and some pomegranates. And, and what was said is the grapes, the clusters of grapes were so large that, that two men had to carry those clusters back. And they get back to the camp and they compile their massive report and they're saying, hey, this land is like nothing that we've ever seen. This land is so full of, of resources. It's literally flowing with milk and honey. But there's something else about the land. Uh, the land has inhabitants and these inhabitants are advanced. They have uh, barricades. They have cities with walls. They have, um, they, there's many people in this land. And Caleb, hearing the report that his, uh, that his 11 other or 10 other uh, scouts were saying, said, listen, this is nothing for the Lord. We need to go in right now and we need to take the land. And there was 10 of the other scouts feared what they had to say. And they began embellishing the report. They said, oh, there's giants in the land. We were like, we were like bitty grasshoppers compared to these. Oh, we would get crushed. And the, the whole of Israel began to mourn and began to weep and began to cry saying, oh, Moses, you took us out of Egypt and you've brought us into this place only for us to die. We need to, we need to veto you. We need to reelect another leader. We need to remove you out of office and put another leader in. And my goodness, we should just head right back into Egypt. Maybe they'll take us back in. Well, Caleb and Joshua, they became really frustrated. And they said this, Joshua stands and he says this. He says, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I believe there's so much that we can learn from this. My goodness, the story continues to go on and it's, it's not well for the people of Israel. God gets angry with them and Moses has to intervene saying, hey, let's not be too drastic here. And, and God says to the people of Israel, hey, for every day that the scouts were in the land, which was 40 days, it is going to set back your destiny from going into the promised land each a day. For every day that you were in that land, it's going to set you back a year. Their destiny was postponed a year by their disbelief and their rebellion against the Lord. I believe that we're in a time like this where God is removing disbelief out of the heart of believers that want it. God is removing the disbelief out of the church and moving us back into a place where we will walk back into our destiny that God has for us. And that destiny is simple. It's to be a light and a salt to the earth. It's to, it's to be a beacon of hope to all of creation. It's to bring his kingdom now, his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the destiny of the church. And I believe that we're entering a time right now, and, and even though I hate what's going on, it's, it's painful. I experience the pain of what's going on in our world. God always uses these times of, of turning up the heat, turning up the discomfort, turning up uh, the, using the, the calamities of the world to begin cutting back, to begin uh, trimming back the vines to the branches. None of us want to be trimmed, but Jesus has promised us this. He says, hey, you will either be trimmed or you will be cut off completely. Now that's kind of a, a nerve wracking message, but I for one would rather be trimmed and be fruitful than just be lobbed off from the branch completely. I believe that the church is entering into a time where, where we will be cut back, trimmed back, pruned back so that we can be more fruitful. And what I believe that God is trimming out of us is, is disbelief. Now, you might say, George, how can you say we're the church? That's how everything's built on belief. Um, uh, we just believe in Christ. And, and well, here's the thing. 
belief should always uh, should always follow behavior, or rather, behavior should always follow belief. James says, even the demons believe and they shudder. And here's the thing. Uh, James talks about faith without works is dead. Faith without action, belief without action um, is dead. So belief um, is the beginning of behavior. So if your behavior does not indicate that you believe, what is that belief? It's not actually anything. And I believe that the church is in, is in the time where we will begin shifting if we are obedient to what God is doing right now. We will be shifting in this posture of saying that we believe with our mouth, but our actions speaking differently. And here's what I want to encourage you today. Um, the promises of blessing of God versus occupation. And so uh, Joshua and Caleb are, are looking at the land and they're seeing the promises of God and the rest of the 10 scouts are just seeing that the fact is that the enemy is occupying things. We live in the world of two realities. We live within, if you are a born again believer, you live in the world of two realities. You live in a world um, where, where you're subject to acts of God. You're subject to droughts and pestilence and pandemics. And you're subject to, uh, you're also subject to, to authorities and uh, national authorities and, and states. And you're also subject to um, the things that bind us in the flesh, the, uh, our, our hunger, our need to eat, our, our um, having children and going to work and being productive and having important relationships. We live in a world like that. We're surrounded um, in this world that we live in the flesh, but we also live in a different world. Those of us that have been born again, we've been made a new creation. We've been born anew and we sit in heavenly places. We've been given a commission and a responsibility to see from a lens of the heaven of uh, the kingdom of God down to earth. You have been given uh, authority to... to uh, as you are in Christ, the authority to live as though you are in Christ and bring the kingdom reality into this reality. We live in two places at the same time. I choose to live and believe from that place where we are. Uh, I don't choose to look at the trouble that we now see, but rather I'm going to fix my gaze on the things that I cannot see because... The things that I see now will soon go away. And the things that I cannot see will last forever. They, choose, they chose to believe in a different report of the Lord than Joshua and Caleb chose to believe. They knew that God was promising them the land. They had a lens of God's perspective. They were looking at things through God's perspective, realizing that they were that they were seeing the occupation, but saying, what I see is different than what God is saying. They're choosing to believe a different report. I think for us, this place that we're in now, it's causing us to have to choose what report we believe in. Now, there's so many reports out there. There's reports of conspiracy that we can buy in. There's reports of, um, of doomsday from, from media. Everyone likes to bash the media. There's, there's reports of our own flesh and maybe our own uh, sicknesses and ailment, ailments and sicknesses. Uh, there's all kinds of reports out there. But there comes a point where we need to anchor down and say, what is the report that I'm choosing to anchor myself into? And that report is the exclusive report that I will anchor myself into. Now, my report doesn't change the circumstance. The report of the Lord for the Israelites was God promised us that land. Now, that didn't change the fact that there was occupants in the land. They didn't change the fact that there was, there was going to be some tough battles ahead. But the report is God is with us and is going to remove their protection from them and we will take that land. I love this. This is, this is the challenge that I'm challenging myself with and I'm challenging you in. So 
Hebrews continues to write in Hebrews chapter 3 and then moves into chapter 4. It says, because of their disbelief, they did not enter into the rest of God. The rest of God. What is this rest of God? This amazing thing that God has is, is he has a rest for us that is an inter- eternal rest that we get to experience the rest of eternity with. Uh, with. It's an inheritance. But here's the crazy thing about inheritance. God doesn't like to fit to any rules. Normally an inheritance says, um, hey, when uh, when your relative passes away, they extend what they have to you after they're done with it. They leave it off to their heirs, to their children, and then they will begin to have what their parents left when they die, when they pass away. God does things backwards. He says, look, I'm not waiting to die, but instead when my son dies, then they get the inheritance. And then anyone else that dies to themselves in my son's name gets access to that inheritance right now. The rest of God, the the peace of God, the, the place of rest that we experience with God is not for someday, some uh, sometime for those that believe get to one day experience it when they pass away. But the inheritance is offered to us right now. Right now, the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places. So what does this look like to be in the rest of God? The promise of rest is um, we find ourselves in this place of rest when we kind of fulfill some of these things. Number one, we identify what our purpose and what our assignment is. Our calling, we understand our calling, number one. If you're wondering, hey, what what am I called to do? What is my purpose? Uh, Number one place to find your calling and your purpose is straight out of Scripture. What, number one, when you begin to read the Bible, just begin doing the things that the Bible says. Oh, love your neighbor as yourself. Guess what? You're called to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, be a witness to the ends of the earth. Guess what? You are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be a witness to all the people around you of the goodness of God in your life. There's so many directives that the Bible gives us that that gives us a calling. That's a universal call. We're all called to this. There's some unique callings too. The Bible says that each one of us are given unique gifts. We find our place in the body of Christ with our unique gifts. Listen, number one, we have to begin reading the scripture and actually doing the things that the scripture says. And when we begin doing those things, we find the spiritual gifts, they begin to come out of us. We find ourselves, if you're prophetic, if God has given you a prophetic gift, you will find yourselves living out um, the scriptures, the commissions of God in a prophetic way. If you're, evan- if you're evangelistic, you will find yourselves living out the things that God tells us to do in an evan- evangelistic way. If your gift is the gift of mercy, you will find yourself living out the things the Bible tells you to do in, in a capacity of mercy. Same, same thing with leadership, with, with hospitality, with all the kinds of giftings, the gifts of, of miraculous, of healing, um, uh, the gift of, of hospitality or or mercy or kindness or helps all these gifts you will find your unique niche as you begin to live out the things in in the scripture and then from there you just begin to pray saying god what is my unique assignment in this time where i can find what i'm commissioned to do here on this earth i'm telling you when you don't know your purpose you're not going to experience the rest the peaceful rest that God puts inside of each one of our souls. Number two, we have to realize when we find our rest in Christ, we have to understand who's in charge. This work that we begin to do, we begin to do work on this earth and we begin to minister to others and find our purpose here. Uh, It can be challenging because we feel the burden of fulfilling God's purpose is a Am I doing it right? Am I, am I fulfilling it to the extent that it needs to be fulfilled? Well, here's the thing that I want to encourage. Who is in charge? And this is what the scripture says. I had a very personal experience with Psalm 127. And this is what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. When you say my work is not my work, but it is the work that God is doing through me. It is the work that God has commissioned from the foundations of the world. He put good works for me to do. And ultimately, 
Um, as I begin to do my best, he will work through me and he will multiply the work that I have done. He will fulfill his work through me. It takes the pressure off of you that you've got to figure everything out and that you've got to make everything work. And, and that, that's the place where we lose our peace when we believe that we're the builders of the house and we're building it and putting a plaque on it in the name of God we're building this house. Well, no, it's not. We're building his house. We're just saying, what do you want me to do today? And what you've called me to do through the scripture, what you've called me to do through my gifting, what do you want me to do today? Number three, we find our strength from the Lord. We find um, our peace from God. He deposits that into us. I love this Psalm, Psalm 121. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow my foot to slip. Your protector will not allow, uh, will not slumble, slumber. Behold, the protector of Israel will not slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. And the Lord will watch over you in your coming and your going both now and forever. I think we need to understand that finding the rest of God, uh, finding that peace of God will always be challenged. When you find that place, there will always be some tension that wants to pull you out of that place. I love the story in the Gospels, the story where the disciples are in a boat with Jesus and they're going across uh, the Sea of Galilee and a massive storm comes. Now, I've never been on a boat in the middle of the sea when a massive storm comes, but I have been on a boat when, when, the, the, uh, when the seas are raging, maybe not a storm, but the wind is high and the waves are high. Sarah and I took a trip to Florida and, and took a boat. We, we got on a boat with a, just a small fishing boat that took us out and we wanted to go fishing out in the ocean. The, the driver said, I, I don't know, you wanna try it? And I'm like, yeah, let's try it. Sarah's like, oh, I don't know. We got out there and the waves were just hammering us. We were like, we were like rag dolls, just like a, just being thrown, tossed to and fro. And the boat uh, brought us back in and we had to go back into the bay, into the harbor to find kind of safety and shelter. We were drenched, wet from head to toe because of the waves just crashing. I know what that experience, that's absolutely terrifying. These disciples are out in the sea and they're experiencing the, the storm and the waves. They're just blowing and beating against the boat and, and they're terrified. And the story is that Jesus is sleeping in the boat. He's, he's found his rest. He's found his peace. He's in that place of rest and peace with God. Here's the thing we anchor ourselves back into uh, the report of the Lord. Jesus was in, anchored into the belief that his reality was, was bigger. His reality superseded the reality that there was a storm. The kingdom reality of peace superseded the natural reality of storm. And Jesus woke up from that. The disciples woke him up and he just went out and he's calm the storm. His kingdom reality uh, brought, superseded, and overlaid the natural reality that there was a storm. There is a time, and the time is really, really soon. The time is actually now where the church needs to step up and begin walking in the kingdom reality, the kingdom perspective, the kingdom faith that supersedes the realities of this world. Now, we have to make sure that what we're believing is actually the report of the Lord and not a report of what we are best wishful thinking. Now, we get the report of the Lord through, again, 
through scripture, understanding what his word says, and then matching that to the voice of God. What is he speaking to our heart in this time, in this season? And then we begin declaring the report of the Lord. We choose to believe the things that are unseen than the things that we see in the natural. That is the place we are anchored and we are, we are believing into. Jesus talks about this. He says, listen, um, mountains will have to move when you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. He's comparing the power of that kingdom belief, that power of the behavioral change that happens in your life when you anchor into the, the perspective, the realities of the kingdom of heaven. Literally, mountains will have to move away. And I want to clarify something. Um, belief in faith does not say that the mountains don't exist. Those mountains exist. The reality is there is opposition. There is things that are coming against. There are things, there is oppression. There's all kinds of things. But the kingdom reality says those don't stand a chance. Even with the size of faith, even with the amount of belief, the size of a grain of mustard seed. I want to encourage us as the church today to drown out all of the other reports, to drown out all of the other reports that are that are going on. Some of the reports are inside of our own heart and emotion. I want to push back the, the report of your own soul. I can only imagine uh, those 10 scouts that were super fearful. They looked out and they said, I don't know if it's worth going and trying to take over this land. It's going to be very hard. The report of their own soul said, no, this is too big. They needed to believe in the report of the Lord. Like Caleb, like Joshua. I want to ask us, the church today, to begin looking from a different perspective, consistently looking from a different perspective. Is the report of the Lord that the sick remain sick? Or is the report of the Lord that the sick will be healed? Is the report of the Lord that those that are far from God stay far from God? Is the report of the Lord doom and destruction? Or is the report of the Lord uh, uh, salvation and blessing? Now, here's the thing. The scripture promises those that don't believe will experience the doom. But we know the report of the Lord is that his will is that all would be saved. And I, for one, want to press into that place, to exercise my faith, to stand in a place of belief and begin moving in that direction. I want to begin standing in the place where believing for miracles, uh, believing for things uh, that I don't see to be though as I see them bringing kingdom of heaven onto earth. I want to pray with you guys this morning, all across your homes and homes all across the city, all across the state, all across Michigan, Ohio, the United States, the world. Let's just begin to pray. I want to still our hearts today. Jesus, you asked us to pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we want to know, we want to see what is in heaven that we may begin to declare it on earth. God, we want to throw our anchor into the place of your heavenly perspective. God, so we can bring it into our earthly situations, God. Not for our own benefit, not so that we can... Uh, exclusively be prosperous, God, but that your mission would advance all around us. Father, though the nations rage against you, God, though there's droughts and plagues and pandemics, God, we find our hope and our trust in you. God, we don't find our hope and our trust in our own understanding. We don't find our hope and our trust in our own places of our soul and emotions. But God, we trust in the promises of the Lord. We trust in the report of the Lord. That when we're faithful to you, we believe in you, that you will be with us. You will be our help. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks for joining us. 
uh, I can't wait to see you again. I can't wait until I can just give you a big hug. And if I haven't met you, I can't wait to shake your hand and say hi to you. Um, I hope that if you're connecting uh, regularly to the City Light services that we'll see you back again when we're able to have in-person meetings. And hey, if you're too far uh, to get to a City Light service, we plan to continue to push out our messages and you can kind of be a part of the City Light family uh, no matter how far you are away. So bless you. I can't wait to see you again.